This is a Nightline Friday Night Special. It's August 4th, 1964. We're going to uh, retaliate and uh, we'll make an announcement a little later in the evening. Yes. The Gulf of Tonkin slides the nation further into Vietnam. What did we launch? We launched two F-8 fighter aircraft, two A-4D. The bodies of three missing civil rights workers are found in Mississippi. I call the families and tell them that uh, with the announcement in the next 10 or 15 minutes, we'll as soon as we get proper identification and let them know further. And on the oh, eve of his nomination, the president seriously considers not running for re-election. The South is against me, and the North is against me, and the Negroes are against me. The press didn't really have that affection for me. Tonight, uh, the LBJ tapes. A remarkable day in the life of a president. This is ABC News Nightline. Substituting for Ted Koppel and reporting from Washington, Aaron Brown. By any definition, Lyndon Johnson was a complex man. Persuasive what he wanted to be, manipulative what he needed to be. Confident enough to seek the most powerful job in the world and insecure enough to doubt he was up to the job. Historians tell us all these things about LBJ, but it is somehow different, more powerful when you hear it from the man himself. And tonight you will. Johnson taped many of his calls and meetings, and another batch of those tapes was released today. They cover a brief period in the middle of the summer of 1964, almost exactly 33 years ago. Lyndon Johnson was in the early months of his presidency. The civil rights bill had just been signed. There was hope and violence attached to it. The president had moved on to a political fight over his proposed war on poverty. A showdown there was coming. And in Southeast Asia, the war was building. Tonight, one day in that summer, August 4th, it was a day that changed the country and changed its president. An American ship had been shot at by North Vietnamese boats in the Gulf of Tonkin two days before. The administration, it's clear from the tapes, expected a second attack. The president's day began on the phone with his defense secretary. The war was about to escalate. What I was thinking about when I was eating breakfast, but I couldn't talk it. I was thinking that it uh, looks, looks to me like the weakness of our position is that uh, uh, we respond uh, only to an action, and uh, we don't have any of our own, but when they when they move on us and they shoot at us, I think we not only ought to shoot at them, but almost simultaneously uh, uh, pull one of these things that you... You've been doing right. on one of their bridges or something. Exactly. I, I quite agree with you, Mr. President. I'm not not sure that the response ought to be as that sharp suggests. Well, I may not. I, I'm not either. I'm not either. I don't know unless I knew what base it was and what right. it's confirmed. But I, I wish we could have something uh, that we've already picked out and uh, and just hit about three of them damn quick. Right after. We will have that. And, and I, I talked to Mac Bundy a moment ago and told him that I thought that was the most important subject we should consider. Uh, today and, and be prepared to recommend to you a response, a retaliation move against North Vietnam in the event this attack takes place within the next six to nine hours. And we, uh, now, we better do that at lunch. There's some yeah. things I don't want to go in with these other. I want to keep this as close as I can, so let's just try to keep it to the two of be prepared uh, to do so at lunch. All right. At 11.06, the President's Defense Secretary, Robert McNamara, is back on the phone again, telling the President the North Vietnamese have attacked. President, we just had word by telephone from Admiral Sharp that the uh, destroyer is under torpedo attack. I think I might get uh, Dean Rusk and Mac Bundy have them come over here and we'll go over these retaliatory actions. And then we ought to. I sure think you all agree with that. Yeah. And uh, I've got a category here. I'll call it to them. Now, where are these torpedoes coming from? Well, we don't know. Presumably from these unidentified craft that I mentioned to you a moment ago. We thought that the unidentified craft might include one. Uh, one PT boat, which has torpedo capability, and two SWAT top boats, which we don't credit with torpedo capability, although they may have it. What are these planes are doing around while they're being attacked? Well, presumably the planes are attacking the, the ships. We don't have any uh, word from, from Sharp on that. The planes would be in the area at the present time, all, all eight of them. Joining us throughout the program tonight to help us make some sense of these phone calls is LBJ historian Robert Dalek. Professor... Did the president on August 4th know how significant the Gulf of Tonkin event was going to be in his presidency? Well, he didn't know that it was going to lead to the kind of massive escalation that 
led him into a war that destroyed his presidency. But he certainly knew that this was a major statement on the part of the United States that the North Vietnamese had better desist from their aggression. And it had the potential for larger uh, involvement. Did he think it would end there? He hoped it would end there. He hoped that this would be a signal to the North Vietnamese that they couldn't get away with aggression. But, of course, it didn't work out that way. Stay with us. We'll come back to you in a moment. But late in the afternoon on August 4th, news of the incident in the Gulf of Tonkin had started to leak out. The president was concerned about leaks, and Defense Secretary Robert McNamara was on the phone again. The president, the story is broken on the AP and the UP. Yeah, I see it. And uh, uh, we've tried to track it down. Jim Greenfield talked to the AP, I understand, and was told it came from a source close to the Pentagon who was alleged to be a chairman of a congressional committee. I don't know what the source is, but anyhow, it's broken. A long night was ahead. The reporters had the story, the attack in the Gulf of Tonkin. Speechwriters at the White House were preparing a national TV address by the president. And then the phone rang again. It was just a little bit after 8 o'clock. This time it was the FBI on the line. They had news of the three missing civil rights workers in Mississippi. Uh, Mr. President, yeah. uh, Mr. Hoover wanted me to call you, sir, immediately and tell you that the FBI has uh, found three bodies six miles southwest of Philadelphia, Mississippi, the six miles west of where the civil rights workers were last seen on the night of June 21st. Now, a search party of agents uh, turned up the bodies just about 15 minutes ago while they were digging in the woods and underbrush uh, several hundred yards off Route 21 in that area. We're going to get a coroner there right away, sir, and uh, we're going to move these bodies into Jackson, Mississippi, where we hope they can be identified. We have not identified them as yet as the three missing men, but we have every reason to believe that they are the three missing men. They were under a, they were at the site of a dam that had been constructed uh, near Philadelphia, Mississippi. Want to let you know right away, sir. This is ABC News Nightline. Brought to you by Lexus. Anybody out, there? Anybody out there? Of course not. I'm Highway 50, the loneliest road in America. No sights, no shops, nothing but asphalt. The road is cold. And the 200 horsepower V6 ES300 will help you answer it. Oh, now, traffic jam. Every year, one film dares to be different. This year, it's Yuli's Gold. You should get on with your life. No. The story of a family on the edge and the man who brought them back. Casey, open the door. What for? She left your kids, remember? Oh, God, Pop. A triumph, Rolling Stone. Two thumbs up, way up, Siskel and Ebert. Profound and mesmerizing, the Los Angeles Times. Hurt any one of them, and you won't get a damn thing. Yuli's Gold, rated R, now playing. Sunday, a coup attempt against the speaker fails. Republican leaders in disarray. Join Sam Donaldson and me at a special time this week, Sunday. Greetings from Purity Dairies. Today, we'd like to thank our workforce. To those who stand tall for decadence in ice cream. To those whose tireless efforts yield pleasures like chocolate toffee sundae and blackjack cherry. To those who look far and wide for delicious ingredients like Madagascar vanilla and dark Dutch chocolate. And finally, everyone here on the executive committee would like to thank the little people. Purity. Great taste. Pure and simple. In the ten weeks since he was born, his body length has increased by 15%. His weight has more than doubled. He is, by all accounts, healthy, happy, and a joy to his family. In fact, they can't imagine life without him. Baptist Hospital. More than health care, health caring. By 8 o'clock on the night of August 4th, 1964, the president had his hands full. In just two hours, the U.S. would launch a major attack on North Vietnam and escalate the war. 
The FBI was pushing to make an announcement that it had found the bodies of the three missing civil rights workers in Mississippi. Events were moving faster than the president could control. When are you going to make an announcement? Within 10 minutes, sir, if it's all right with you. How are you going to make it? Where? From there? From, I plan to make it from Washington here, sir. Uh -huh. This indicates the FBI has uh, found three bodies but not identify them. Okay, if you can hold it about 15 minutes, I think I'll notify these families. At 8.35, another call. This time a better call. Hey, uh, Darling. Yes, beloved. Did you want me? Uh, I just wanted to see you whenever you were all alone. All right. Just merely to tell you I loved you, that's all. Well, I'll be over there. The Russell still there? No, they left at 3.30 this afternoon, dear. Darling, well, why didn't they tell me you're back? Uh, because I guess they just they figured you just didn't have a moment. I don't know. Got any other news? Uh, uh, nothing in comparison to yours, darling. I'll try and get some of the water and I'll come over just as soon as I get through. Uh, honey, yeah. uh, bring anybody who's a bachelor or who wants to eat or who would otherwise be doing without supper until real late with you, will you? Okay. Bye. A 40-second break, then back to business. Texas Congressman George Mayen is on the phone. Vietnam, the topic. What we've done, uh, we are going to uh, uh, we're going to uh, retaliate, and uh, we'll make an announcement a little later in the evening, the next hour or so, and we'll probably ask Congress for a resolution tomorrow, next day, uh, to support us. Oh yes. Well, as you know, you'll get whatever you want. But I don't know. I hope so. All these folks here said they'd go along tonight, so yeah, I guess it's all right. I imagine everybody was uh, yes. holding something. Well, Mike Mansfield, what? he didn't eat all we ought to get out of there. Just stay away. He doesn't want to fight anybody. Yeah, well, I... But Russ pointed out that that's the most dangerous course you could follow. Yeah. If you don't react when they shoot at your ships on the high seas 60 miles from shore... You can't appear to be a weak or appeasing on a thing when the issue is so clearly drawn. They attacked us yesterday, and they attack us again today. Yeah. You're on the right track, Mr. President. And thanks so much for calling. Okay, now tell me, what's happened to my poverty today? LBJ historian Professor Robert Dalek joins us again. In this series of phone calls we hear with all of that is going on in Southeast Asia, the president asking all of these congressmen, what's this going to do to the poverty bill? He was nervous about the bill and was important to him. Most important thing on his agenda. This was the heart of his presidency, the war on poverty, the great society. He wanted to be the greatest reform president in American history, he wanted to eclipse, eclipse FDR. This was at the center of what he saw his presidency as. And did he worry that Vietnam would destroy it? He was worried that if he didn't fight in Vietnam, it would produce a, a McCarthyist reaction that would overwhelm his presidency. He was worried that if he did fight in Vietnam, it would so distract him that it would undermine the war on poverty and great society. In some ways he felt he was damned if he did and damned if he didn't. And it turned out to be exactly that way. What effect is our asking Congress for a resolution to support us in Southeast Asia and bombing hell out of the Vietnam, the Vietnamese tonight? What effect will that have on this bill? I, will it kill it or help us? Uh, it, uh, it won't hurt us, but I just don't know what hope or not. I think it'd be a little more reluctant to vote against the president. I would think so. In Southeast Asia, the attack on North Vietnam was running late. The targets wouldn't be hit until midnight Washington time. The speech announcing the attack was scheduled for 10. LBJ was worried and on the phone with Bob McNamara again. I sure as hell hate to have some mother say you announced it my boy got killed. I don't think there's much damage uh, or much uh, danger of that, Mr. President. How late would you be willing to hold it today? I just... Uh, uh, I guess we could hold it till 11 o'clock news. I don't know. We don't have to make it, do we? Oh, I think uh, I think you need to make some kind of a statement of this kind. Because tomorrow morning will be too late. Something will have to be on the news tomorrow morning. It ought to come from you. What do you think about it? I don't see why we bring Goldwater in on this. Why don't we just say I thought it appropriate just to communicate my decision to the Republican candidate for president? Uh, and not say he's assured me of his full support. I think it makes us sound like we're very much together and buddies and agreeing on bombing everybody. Within an hour, Goldwater was found. Hello. Hello. Barry. Yeah. I'm going to make a statement uh, in a little bit, uh, and I wanted to talk to you before I did. Uh, 
As President and Commander-in-Chief, it's my duty to the American people to report that renewed hostile actions against U.S. ships on the high seas in the Gulf of Tonkin have all have today required me to order the military forces of the United States to take action in reply. Now, when I say the reply is being given, Barry, I may elaborate on that a little bit, depending on how safe I can be at the time I deliver the statement. Do you follow me? I don't know what else you can do. Well, we are uh, just very confidentially, uh, 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 we are going to uh, uh, take all the boats out that we can and all the bases in which they come. Well, I think it's, uh, I think it's proper action. I think you can take the right step. I'm sure that you'll find everybody will be behind you. The determination of all Americans to carry out our full commitment to the people and to the government of South Vietnam will be redoubled by this outrage. Yet our response for the present will be limited and fitting. We Americans know, although others appear to forget, the risk of spreading conflict. We still seek no wider war. Professor Dalek, you, you see that speech and you can't help but think that somehow this is the beginning of the personal destruction of LBJ. Well, it was. Johnson starts down the road to escalation in the Vietnam War. The Vietnam War destroys his presidency. His presidency was Lyndon Johnson. This is what his life was bound up with. And uh, he leaves in 1968 or announces he won't stay on anymore. And it was uh, the end of his career. But what's remarkable, and as you will hear in a moment, even in August of 64, he was quite a tormented soul. That when we return. It is a basic desire of people everywhere to want to do their jobs better, to design better homes, make a better life, even build a better car. The new Camry. Over 6,500 American workers. Hundreds of improvements. It's been called the best car built in America, only now it's even quieter, smoother, more comfortable. The new Camry. Better than ever. Oh, hi, Mr. Wright. Sure, just one minute. Hello, everyone. I've had to cut my vacation short. I'll be in the office in... 10 minutes. See you then. Ericsson Mobile Phones. That's the power of voice. I just love doing that. <laughs> Tonight, P.I. asks if it's possible to have male-to-male -male sexual harassment, or is that called football? That's it. We're suing. Politically Incorrect with Bill Maher, coming up on ABC Late Night. It's just not summer until you drive into Sonic. Day or night, it's a great place to people watch. I like to see their faces when they try one of our new fresh fruit slushes. There's our lemon slush with fresh sun-kissed lemons, our lemon berry slush, and our fresh lime slush. They are totally fresh and very, very cold. I recommend you drink them slowly. K-Swiss. What a beautiful look. And ooh, K-Swiss Lausanne. Mm, nice touch. The K-Swiss Classic. Comfortable and durable. And the K-Swiss Beato tennis shoe. And when it's the other person's time to surf. The Zurich and the Surf and Turf. On sale for just $19.99 at Just for Feet. K-Swiss Comfort. For $19.99, you may never want to take them off. But sometimes, maybe you should. Just for Feet. Where the 13 pair is free. Into the pits with major damage. To make it here, you gotta have the right tools. Race in for Shoney's new 4.99 half pound burger or charboiled chicken sandwich with fries and get a Coke free. Get a clear NASCAR collectible trading card for the kids free with any adult purchase. And kids, color my car and enter to win your family a racing weekend with me. Clear, clear, clear. It's amazing what you can do with a few crayons. Free Coke, free trading card, free weekend with Kyle. Great job, guys. Race to Shoney's. Yeah. On Friday, August 25th, 1964, in the midst of the Democratic Convention in Atlantic City, 
all of LBJ's most vexing political problems seem to be pressing in on him. His difficulties as a southerner in building a coalition on civil rights, finding the right running mate, political infighting at the convention, and the disruptive tactics of the Kennedy forces. That morning in the Oval Office, after reading some hostile newspaper editorials, Johnson impetuously drafted an announcement that he was absolutely unavailable for the Democratic nomination for president. Just after 11 that morning, he called his press secretary, George Reedy, and read him the nearly complete statement, and then launched on a remarkable monologue full of resignation, wounded pride, and despair. I don't want this power of the bomb, and I just don't want these decisions that I've been required to make. And I don't want the conniving that's required. I don't want the disloyal that's around. I don't want the bumbling and the inefficiencies. And our people and all of them talk too much. But I am absolutely positive that I cannot lead the South, the North, and the South. And I don't want to lead the nation without my own state, without my own section. Uh, I, I, I'm very uh, convinced that the Negroes uh, uh, will not listen to me. They're not going to follow a white Southerner. And I, I think the stakes are too big to try to compromise. And, and they're just bound to be a lot of uh, people that... Uh, don't have these doubts, and these angers, and these, these barnacles, and these uh, things they have to carry, and the nation ought to have a chance to get the best available. That's who I want my children to have, and uh, I know that I'm not. George Reedy tried to buck up his boss's spirits by appealing to LBJ's instincts as a political battler. I think it's too late, sir. The, I know it's your decision because you're the man that has to bear the brunt. Right now, I think this just gives the country the gold water. Well, that's all right. I don't care. I I just wanted to. Uh, I don't think that. I don't agree with that. Though, but I, I I think he can do better than I can. Because he can't, sir. He's just a child. And look at our side. We don't have anybody. I have a desire to unite people, and uh, uh, the South is against me, and the North is against me, and the Negroes are against me. really have an affection for me. I think, sir, that uh, to a certain extent you have to remember much worse things than that have been said about presidents, sir. Well, that's Abraham right. Abraham Lincoln was called a baboon. That's right. I'm, I'm not to uh, debate. No, I know that. that. Whether, whether it did or not, I know that. I know another Johnson said in the same place and suffered more anguish than I'm suffering. But I don't see the reason why I need to. Immediately after hanging up with Reedy, LBJ called senior White House staffer Walter Jenkins and told him of his decision. He began by wondering which of his rivals would win the nomination. And I don't know who it'd be. I expect it'd be Bobby Kennedy and Hubert Humphrey, whoever they are. But uh, I believe they can get along with the Negroes better than I can. I'd, uh, I don't see any reason why I'll seek the right to uh, endure uh, uh, anguish that I... Uh, that they're doing here. I don't know why I want that right. Uh, people, I think, have a mistaken judgment. They think I want great power. And what I want is great uh, solace and a little love. That's all I want. You have a lot more of that. Uh, well, I don't know. I don't think a white Southerner is the man to unite this nation in this hour. I have tried, and I, I've had doubts about whether a man born where I was born raised like I was raised could ever satisfy the northern Jews and Catholics and uh, Union people. Now they're younger men and, and better prepared men and better trained men and Harvard uh, uh, educated men and, and uh, I know my own limitations and I just don't believe that I have the, the physical and mental strength to carry it. I thought about it a good deal this morning. I have read the statement in 20 years, but I'm just getting ready to write this one. I just got one more sentence on it. I told him to have a helicopter stand by, and I'll decide during the lunch hour what I do about it. It would be a letter from Johnson's wife, Lady Bird, that would convince him to accept the nomination. An extraordinary letter, as you will hear when we come back.
We really wanted to bring out the character of our home. Which meant repainting everything. Right now, Sears has every gallon of paint on sale. Like this interior, just $4.99. Or this exterior paint, only $5.99. They were so helpful. Going to Sears was like having a partner in all this. Some families get more done in a day than others do in a week. They're the first to do anything, including to say... Hey, how's it going? Now there's a car that does as much as your supercharged family. Introducing the all-new supercharged Regal GS. No other sports sedan squeezes in this much supercharged... Fun! ...power and standard safety features into your daily routine. Regal GS by Buick. Hey, life's a blur. The all-new Regal GS. The official car of the supercharged family. We really wanted to bring out the character of our home. Which meant repainting everything. Right now, Sears has every gallon of paint on sale. Like this interior, just $4.99. Or this exterior paint, only $5.99. They were so helpful. Going to Sears was like having a partner in all this. Do you ever just have one of those days? Well, at Farmers Insurance, everything we do is about getting things back to normal. Isn't that what insurance is supposed to do? Farmers, get you back where you belong. You've hired the perfect nanny. I adore children. She's become part of your family. You take care of me. You've entrusted her with everything. And your daddy, too. Even your life. And your husband makes love to you. It's my fate. Get out of our house. What goes around comes around. We don't know what she's capable of. Claire? The movie that gave babysitters a bad name. Mommy! Rebecca De Mornay, The hand that rocks the cradle. Parental discretion advised. ABC Saturday. Last night, my subconscious had me thinking Dairy Queen. Visions of a fudgy treat filled my head. The new fudge cake supreme, to be exact. Whoa! Two layers of chocolate cake. Luscious, soft serve, rich hot fudge, creamy whipped toppings, polished off with a cherry. Yum, I was falling in love. Talk about your sweet dreams. The new Fudge Cake Supreme, a dream come true. For hotties, cool treats, don't be cute. President Johnson said years later that more than anything else, it was his wife who kept him from withdrawing from the race in 1964. He had shown her the statement that he'd written, had asked her for her reaction, and she immediately responded with a letter of her own. Extraordinary in a number of ways, not the least of which was its effect on history. Lady Bird Johnson read that letter for us tonight from her home in Texas. Beloved, you are as brave a man as Harry Truman or FDR or Lincoln. You can go on to find some peace, some achievement amidst all the pain. You have been strong, patient, determined beyond any words of mine to express. I honor you for it. So does most of the country. To step out now would be wrong for your country, and I can see nothing but a lonely wasteland for your future. Your friends would be frozen in embarrassed silence, and your enemies jeering. I am not afraid of time, or lies, or losing money, or defeat. In the final analysis, I can't carry any of the burdens you talk of, so I know it's only your choice. But I know you are as brave as any of the 35. I love you always. Bird. Lady Bird Johnson, the wife of the 36th president. We'll have more from the just-released LBJ tapes on Monday night. That's our report for tonight. I'm Aaron Brown in Washington. For all of us at ABC News, good night. Nightline has been a presentation of ABC News. More Americans get their news from ABC News than from any other source. ABC News, now always on.